uh, roughly three hours. Um, they are excellent panels. We are really proud of the speakers uh, we have um, uh, on these two panels. The first panel is uh, focusing on Tunisia. Um, when we started designing the program, we did not intend to have a panel on Tunisia, but we received a lot of papers on Tunisia. So we had to make a panel on Tunisia. There is a lot of interest in what's going on um, in, in that country because it raised the hopes and the expectations throughout the world, throughout the Muslim world, and in particularly uh, in the Arab world. So we want to learn about what happened in Tunisia um, and um, what kind of lessons we can learn uh, from that. Um, so again, we have five uh, panelists who will be focusing on, on, the, on the topic of Tunisia and what happened in Tunisia and uh, what went wrong in Tunisia and um, you know, what's the path forward basically for, for democracy in Tunisia. Um, I'd like to uh, ask the speakers to please not exceed 10 minutes because definitely want to leave time at the end for you know, Q&A. Um, and you also have the bios in the program booklet, so I'm not going to uh, read the bios to you. Um, if you want to know more about the speakers, you have their bios in the program. So the first uh, speaker is um, a dear friend, Jose Ignacio Hernandez. He's a, a visiting uh, fellow uh, at Harvard and a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's from Venezuela, so of course he follows Venezuela very closely. But also he saw a lot of similarities between what happened in Venezuela and what's happening in Tunisia today. Uh, so we thought it would be good to, to listen to uh, to him and to the experience uh, or lessons learned from from the two countries and maybe other countries uh, as well. So, Jose, please. Either way, you can, whatever, wherever you're comfortable. Perfect. I'm, I'm quite well here. Well, thank you, thank you so much <coughs> for the invitation for the presentation. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, my attention regarding the. Tunisia constitutional crisis, as Radwan commented, uh, has to do with my home country, Venezuela. Uh, and uh, while I was studying how Venezuela collapsed, I discovered several common patterns uh, with the democratic backslide in Tunisia. And since then, uh, I have been continuing my research on Tunisia. I have published some papers. I am working even in a, in, in, in a, in a comparative book that covers Tunisia. And what I, am, what I want to talk today uh, is how Tunisia should be considered a case of I have been calling constitutional authoritarian populism. Until 30 years ago, democracy used to die in the hands of a traditional military coup. And it was clear that the constitution was violated because external forces with procedures not established in the constitution remove government. But in the last two decades, a new way of democratic backslide emerged. First of all, democratic backslide is hidden beneath constitutional formalities. As Professor Steve Levinsky and Daniel Ziblatt said, democracies are dying from the inside out. The winners of elections are the ones that are killing democracy. So constitutional authoritarianism is the abusive of constitutional forms, of constitutional institutions to hinder democratic values. And it's quite hard to demonstrate that there is a constitutional authoritarianism. Why? 
because the authoritarianism is acting under the disguise of a constitutional form. So for a third party, for a bystander, you know, it's, it's just an emergency decree. This is just a ruling by the constitutional court. This is just a political decision covered by domestic constitutional law. But looking beyond formalities, emerge the authoritarian essence of the measure. But also, in the last years, together with this abusive of constitutional form, we are witnesses how the populist rhetoric, the defense of the people, the protection of the people is used to justify this attack from the inside out over democracy. So there is a playbook of constitutional authoritarian populism that per perfectly fits with the Tunisia case. First of all, there is in a country, Tunisia, a crisis, a political and economic crisis. People are disenchanted with democracy. And as, and as a result, people decided to elect an outsider. A people that promised that he will fight against the elite, that he will reboot the system. And this populist charismatic leader that promised to reboot the system is paradoxically elected in free and fair elections. It happened with President Sayed in 2019. It happened in Venezuela with Hugo Chavez in 1998. And then Nicolás Maduro in 2013. Once in power, this elected president start to work to address a national emergency because people is suffering. People is suffering because there, is, there are elites that are trying to undermine the people's well-being. The elites could be politi political parties. The opposition is the elite. The media, uh, foreigners, migration, private companies, you name it. There are different kinds of elite. And because people is in danger, it is necessarily to use exceptional powers vested in the presidency by the Constitution. Exactly what happened in Tunisia. Exactly what happens in Venezuela. And once the president used these exceptional powers, it started to dismantle the checks and balances and to concentrate power. And one of the, uh, of the victims of this concentration of powers is the parliament. It happens in Tunisia, it happens in Venezuela. There is another institution that so far has not been applied in Tunisia, that is a constitutional court. Authoritarian rulers love to take control of constitutional court. And then the constitutional court, under the political control of the president, will transform human right violations in constitutional measures which is unconstitutional, is transformer in constitutional. That happens, for instance, in El Salvador, when the constitutional court, co-opted by the president, reinterpret the constitution to allow a presidential reelection. In Latin America, one of the main characteristics of this constitutional authoritarian populism are biased constitutional courts that reinterpret the constitution to allow presidential reelection. Another, and I am uh, finishing my, my brief commentary, another element in this playbook, the constituent power, the constitutional modifications. We need a new constitution. And if you remember, you know, when, when in my class I used to say that the, most, the three most famous words in the history of constitutional law is with the people. And the tragedy is that this beautiful phrase, with the people, is transformed in the abusive use, the excess of manipulation of the people to say, well, we need a new constitution that probably is going to be drafted in a special procedure with direct consultation of the people and is going to approve via referendum. Because referendums, direct democracy, Popular consultations are other or the tools that authoritarian populism uses. So what to do? 
And as you can see, I am explaining the result of my comparative research, and it's exactly what happens in Tunisia, but it's not the only case. Venezuela probably was one of the first case countries in experiment with this authoritarian populism. What, what to do then? Uh, in my experience working with Venezuela, I realize that the first battle that democracy needs to win is the battle of the narrative. To unmask the authoritarian nature of the regime that is acting on this guise of constitutional forms. What happens in Tunisia was not that the president issued an extraordinary decree acting under the 2014 constitution, then approved a new constitution, then organized elections with procedures. No, it was a coup against the 2014 constitution under the disguise of constitutional legal forms and of course the populist rhetoric. So narrative is very important because we need to demonstrate, particularly before international organizations such, very important, the African Human Rights Courts, that beyond formalities, there is an authoritarian in essence. And for that, human rights should be at the center of the interpretation. In Venezuela, we started that fight many years ago. I will say that in 2016. And today, different international bodies, particularly the International Criminal Court, has concluded that beyond emergency decrees, constitutional reforms, rulings by the Constitutional Court, beneath that veneer of constitutionality, there is clearly human right violations. And for that purpose, and I'm going to stop here, one of the ideas that I am, we have been working is to try to create a sort of working group about constitutional authoritarian populism. Try to gather experts from the different countries, including, of course, Tunisia, that has been suffering this uh, democratic regression, and explain with arguments and data why these constitutional authoritarian populism are, in essence, authoritarian regimes that violate human rights. Once the battle of the narrative is achieved, then it will be easier to begin the way to the path to recover democracy in Tunisia or, I hope, also in Venezuela. Thank you, thank you so much.